Um, hello and welcome to my stream and I forgot to turn the audio on. Um, great. Yeah, I think this was the first fuck up I did. But yeah, get, get used to it. So what I was uh, trying to show you is virtual machines versus containers. A uh, virtual machine is a complete computer, as you have seen uh, booting up here. And uh, yeah, this is easy. Very, very easy. Um, if you look at those machines, you can, uh, of course, log in or even shut them down. I mean, this one is running as a, <clears throat> well, I'd call it a, um, well, it's a machine, you know, complete one with a hard disk. I can jack in uh, anything I need. And the water cycle started all over again. So as you see, it's got drives, it's a network. All good. And um, yeah, it takes a while to boot. It's not the fastest machines as you can imagine. It's, it's pretty low power because I don't usually use much of my Windows machine. Memory is just 8 gigs for uh, CPUs and this one's pretty busy out, so you can imagine. But the host machine here is still a Linux box. You see its host name is PVE. And if I, uh, let's say, okay, I can't go to the shell directly, I would have to SSH into it, which I'll glad to do for you, for showing you. This is uh, the machine and uh, you see here is my Windows machine jogging along. Um, so I'm not executing the Windows programs on the uh, Linux box here, don't get me wrong. What I'm doing here is um, simulating a complete machine. So if that machine blows up, it's just the machine process dying. So I personally see that as a very secure way of handling things. On the other hand, if you're running a container, um, like the one over here, this is running on the host kernel. So if I haven't closed the machine down, uh, you should be able to uh, see the processes down here somewhere. There we go. It's MariaDB, which is running on that container. So this is actually running on the host, just in its own little cage. On the other hand, if things go uh, sideways with that one, and the kernel gets toasted in terms of, um, you know, compromised, then the whole system is toast because we're on the same kernel. We can jump to other namespaces and stuff if we are convincing enough. So, you know, bad ideas. And uh, those Gentoo machines are actually running as virtual machines here because I want to have them a bit insulated. Um, a big thing about virtual machines is if you look at that uh, Windows box again, I can also shut it down, do various things with it. It's not a big deal. But that machine requires, well, a big amount of power, if you know what I mean. It's freaking four gigs or eight gigs RAM. If I cut down a virtual machine to, let's say, two gigs for a rudimentary system, that's not, that's not too nice. Don't want to do that. So, well, speaking about that, I've got my portainer here. Um, if it opens up, so I can misclick that one. This is about Docker. Docker is about containers, and uh, portainer is basically my management interface to work with containers. So don't worry if you don't get it. Um, a container like this, if I go to the uh, stats, my Git container runs with um, about
about 200 mix. Do I really wanna, well, waste a whole machine simulating the whole thing for just a freaking small container? Do I really want that? Don't think so. I mean, at least I don't want it. I don't want it to. It's it's kind of it's kind of weird, I know. But that's why uh, containers do make sense. Um. Okay, their security is a bit different, their uh, workload is different, and uh, it's not so bad, honestly. And uh, as you see, you can run them in stacks, you can uh, basically say, I need this, depending on that. <clears throat> you can make things easier to update. As a virtual machine, I have the whole machine there. As a container, I have a data partition and an application partition, and uh, if something happens an error an update no matter what i just throw away the application and uh refetch the image so that's also a very nice and convenient way of getting out of trouble or getting into trouble if you uh it depends on how you want to see it so why the hell am i interested so much in linux well let's that's one of those things. Uh, Linux is a beautiful operating system for me. And of course it's free. It is free. Um, not only free as in beer, it's really free. You can do a freaking lot with it. What I do is I run game servers on it. You might have spotted it. I run my own mail server, Minecraft server, an ARC server, you know, kind of like this. Uh, a database machine. I've I've named it wrong because I've migrated out, so that's historically grown. I even run my firewall on that, and the Windows machine is just doing its updates. That's kind of nasty, but <clears throat> that's what it is. So, well, think about it. It's nothing big. It's a funny thing. Um, you can download uh, Linux for free and uh, we can get into setting it up. If you're interested in, let's say, a small machine, I can show you. I can show you the fun part on, well, let's say Debian, because I really hate Ubuntu, but that's for political reasons. So, while uh, that one machine is compiling and doing its thing, I'll fire up another virtual machine for you. There we go. Uh, this one would want an update, but uh, I don't care. As you see, this is a machine I've designated to be my Debian machine. So I've set it up, added um, yeah, some RAM, um, some drives, chipset, all good. On the, for the processors, I've given it four, so we're not uh, that bored. And hardware acceleration as, well, you know, as we're used to. Uh, important thing, I'm gonna use a couple of um, different uh, drives here just because I can, and uh, because it's a um, better way of doing so. If you think about it, why do you wanna have two drives? Those drives are written down on your main hard disk as files, file container. Um, if I'm going to my drive F here, um, having my virtual box here, Debian, that's just files, you know? So, what do we do with those files? Usually it's a process, um, writing there, reading from there, and uh, it's not your virtual machine actually distributing the load. It's the machine that runs the virtual machine. Sounds cute. And it is. So we just distribute the load. So if we're swapping out, we'll just do that the proper way. Um, I'll just disable audio because why needing it? I mean, uh, what I mostly do is what I call a server. 
a machine that, um, you know, uh, runs services to do something. So I don't want to waste any memory CPU power on things I don't need. So I strip it down to the bare minimum. And uh, right now I'll run it with a networking bridge. So as if it would be a physical box. No need for a serial port, um, USB, yeah, okay, let's let's just chuck in a USB 3 port and we're basically good to go. Basically. Um, while my Windows machine here is still, I'll move that aside, it's just a jerk doing updates. I'll just move that out of the way because we'll need it later and disable um, my internal proxy because I don't need it. In the meanwhile, let's start that baby up. Come on, be so kind. Here we go. And we're booting from the CD-ROM. Now, about the installation method, I usually tend to do the non-graphical install. I mean, you can do it with a click, but why? It's faster the other way, at least um, resource-wise. You uh, for running the graphical install, you need a little bit of a beefy machine, at least with two gigs of RAM. You know, beefy in terms of you can't run it on the bare minimum. So I'll just run the install, and as you see, this machine boots up as it would as a normal machine. Language-wise, you've convinced me we're run English. Now, I usually run it in English because I dislike, <clears throat> I personally really dislike the stuff being with uh, wrong translations. And a very, uh, a very, very famous example was uh, a message about no space left on device where they got the space and the location a bit wrong. You can Google that if you want to. And if you are a German native speaker, you might enjoy this because it means kein Weltraum mehr links am Gerät. And they translated space with auto space, so just so you get the reference. My territory is in Europe, as you might have uh, gotten from my accent. I'm in Austria, uh, we're using um, the English UTF-8 and I'm gonna use my German keyboard because I don't want to break my fingers. And that's where the machine boots. Um, in the meanwhile, how is my uh, proxy? It's just about to. I'm logging in. Come on. <clears throat> so while this machine is booting, I'm just um, convincing my web proxy to not do any uh, filtering and blocking. There we go. And. Um, as you see, it's configuring the network. That's all running from the live CD. So it gets the basic system up and running. We're using a net installer, which is a good thing, you know? Uh, it just boots a local system. And what it really does is it gets you the most recent packages from the internet, pulls it in, and that's it. So I'd say I'm going to go with the uh, host name of uh, Debian VM. So, you know, VM because it's a virtual machine. The main name, I use my internal domain name, which is Stargazer Systems, because, um, you know, I can do that. Oh, I'm stuck. Okay, um, now let the show begin. Uh, it says it wants a root password from me, which I won't share with you. And uh, there we go. Uh, it wants a new user because you shouldn't work as root, so you should have your everyday user. Uh, on my machine, sometimes I delete that uh, internal, uh, you know, that um, initial made user, the user account here. So I'll just call it, let's say, test. And uh, set it up with a password so I can delete it later. Uh, very important, we're getting the uh, date and time from the network, so our clock is always correct, which is nice to have. And the disk partitioner starts up. 
Um, I usually do a manual uh, partitioning. On the one disk here is the swap partition. And the other one is NexFS. Hi, Moretta. How are you doing? Hope you enjoy it. Hope to have you here. How's the cat? As you see, um, my uh, primary hard disk here. I'll use that one with, uh, let's say, XFS. You can choose any oper um, any file system you uh, want to use. I personally like the XFS on server machines because it's one of those rigid file systems that it never let me down. Uh, well, in fact, there's only one thing that it doesn't like, and that's uh, power outages. And as this machine is hooked up to a uh, power supply, Oh, yeah, the uh, food collapse of the cat. So, um... Cat Spencer it was, right? And, uh, as you see, I can format the petition. And as a mount point, this is something we need to speak about a little. On Linux, we don't have the uh, disks as you would have on Windows. So there is no drive C, uh, no drive D, no E, no F. We don't have drive letters. We just have paths and uh, we don't use the backslash we use the slash and the slash is the root file system which is the base system historically i mean yes we can talk about that uh historically if you're looking at that stuff uh discs were a bit expensive uh, especially bigger discs and uh we're talking about uh, discs where the size, the average size was about the washing machine. So really huge discs and um, it was cheaper to get two smaller discs and uh, link them together. So you had a root file system like this and then you uh, had your home directory where your users worked on a different disc or anywhere else. So kind of like that, you know. You can uh, split that up and uh, Chuck it in at any path you like, but you need a slash, um, yeah, this direction for you. You need one slash, so the root file system. And uh, if you want to have that, I mean, on, you should have that on your um, file system that the bootloader can read, which is a good thing. Mount options, um, this is something that you can do using the no A time, so it doesn't really care about the times you access the file. Just unwind, unwinding my legs here. Sorry. Oh. Sitting here for a while, so one leg went sleepy. You can also say you want to have uh, writing in sync, which is um, as soon as the data is really written, it's not written to a cache and swapped out to disk when it's needed. Um, you can also say um, you write it when you get it. It depends on the usage scenario. Usually you don't want this because it's slower. But on some situations you might want to have it. If you want to limit uh, data usage on a disk, go ahead, use quotas. But there is one thing you should never, ever enable on your root file system, which is the no def, no suit, suite and no exec, which means you don't support those uh, things on, on that disk, which is, well, not what you want to have on your root file system. But on other parts, like if you're having a disk where you just chuck in log files, it's pretty fine. In fact, it increases security for those because nobody can smuggle and execute it, uh, a binary there and try to execute it because it's prohibited. So, this disk is bootable and we're done setting it up and for the second one I'm using the swap partition. So yeah, as you see swap area is just, um, swap is about memory. We have uh, 4 gigs of RAM in there and uh, so I use the rule of thumb by uh, having that twice as uh, swap space so you can just uh, swap out your memory. So if something doesn't fit in the memory, you can push chunks out on disk um, and prevent your computer from um, raping programs. Yeah, it really kills the processes that are um, using too much memory. So 
I can say, please write changes to disk. And uh, here we go, we're doing that. And uh, as you see, it's installing the absolute minimum, the base system. And this is where it, well, you know, if you're on Debian or 10, you should use a net install for Debian 10 because you don't want to do a complete update. Uh, this talks you down to the base version, so make sure you got that right. You can do that with uh, mostly any uh, distribution, so installing from the network, which is something I really recommend. It saves you a lot of updating, trust me. And uh, we're also uh, getting files from the mirrors if, you, if we need to. And it says retrieving, so yeah. That's how it's done. Now, if we look at that, we're pretty fine, fine and dandy. Music's good, systems installing, tea is still hot, so what do you want more? But now you might ask me, hey Ray, what the frick am I gonna do with a system like that? Why don't you ask? I personally, I personally uh, run software tests on such uh, virtual machines, game servers, or anything that I consider being insecure. And if you look at the uh, game industry, how fast they push things out, I wouldn't consider servers, game servers especially, being secure. So, yeah. It's one of those things where I say, what the fluff? <clears throat> So, no, we don't want to add another CD, and I'm using my mirrors here, which is a local mirror just around the corner, literally. I could also just grab them from Switzerland, but um, due to the corona lockdown, I'll stay in Austria, you know. Um, and here it's uh, getting the uh, most recent packages and packages lists. So we want to know what's on the mirror, and of course, the very important thing is we want the files. We wanna um, you don't want to download the whole mirror, so you get an index, what's there, got the uh, where to verify that and stuff like that. Nothing big. Okay. Um. With the mirror you see the stream is a bit jittering and it's it's doing the upgrades now so it's pulling in from the net and uh, that degrades my stream of performance a lot so what i can do is um setting up a local uh, mirror you know what i mean okay let me show you um my virtual machines let me get that over for you uh we have something on the portainer that is my local registry um where do i have it infrastructure registry this thing is a sonotype nexus which is a cute little program running in java as most of the stuff and this is a repository manager that can proxy my repositories and uh, so I've done the uh, Debian remote so it proxies the stuff so it doesn't need to download it from the network. So easy as that and I can add them to that machine later. But as you see it's it's doing pretty well. Um, 20 seconds remaining I think we can wait for that. Love the tea in the morning. So, about that Debian machine, um, there are a couple of things uh, we should think about at first. What's it gonna be? What's it gonna do? Um, in my case, uh, this machine will be a demo install for you. So, I'm gonna just do a bare minimum install. So, you know, keeping it all stripped down, no extra fluff, no sprinkles just the bare minimum, and we'll see how uh, how big uh, the system will grow. And compare that to, well, Windows, if you want to. Um, 
The Linux image, as you see, is the 419 kernel. Oh, hi, Lord. How are you doing? Uh, um, how's the, um, how are the dice today? Did you roll a one again? Just trying to do an, an English stream, you know, uh, showing off uh, the home lab, doing some work. Um, what I was saying is, if you go to kernel.org, um, this is the Linux kernel. Yeah, I'll look into the Discord afterwards, I uh, promised. Um, you see, here are a lot of kernels. And this one, even if it looks pretty uh, recent, it's kind of... Well, let's Google for it when the original version was released. The release date of the 419 series was the 22nd of October. Yeah. And if you look at that uh, version table here, um, it's kind of... Um, yeah. I don't want to say it's kind of fucked, but kind of ancient. And uh, this is something, by the way, about Debian I love about. Um, they ask you if you want to participate in the package usage survey. And um, if you say no, they don't send any data out uh, unless uh, you opt in. And uh, what I'm going to do here is just uh, unchecking everything here because I want a bare minimum system. And uh, that's fine for me. I can pull in the packages later that I need. I just don't want to be overwhelmed with crap. If I want to have an SSH daemon in there, I'll install it. I mean, we will do so, trust me. If I want to have a desktop environment, which I don't want to have in this case, I will install just the packages I need for that. And um, you say, oh, I sound like I'm from Texas. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, could be that's, uh, that I communicated with a few people from Texas and uh, they messed my accent up or something like that. I don't know. But uh, my English is uh, is as it is, so you're gonna just suck it up, okay? If people don't understand something, just ask. Um, Grub is the bootloader. That's the, um, well, that's the thing that kicks off the Linux kernel. And speaking about that, if you think about it, it's the first bits of a disk, so you want to write that into the master boot sector of the first disk, which is what I'm going to do here. And um, the kernel is able to, ru uh, to run one process as a PID1, the process ID. And uh, what this is, I'm going to show that to you in a minute, is a process manager. You know the uh, Windows services? Um. I'll show you uh, what it is here. This is basically the service manager of Windows. And this is basically what our server here launches. If it's, okay, we're here at the um, virtual machine. And uh, it's really a bare minimum machine. Uh, you might be used to using if config. IPUtils are not there, so you are forced to use IP address, which works. As you see, it's got an address, it's everything is set up, so not bad, not bad. Can I download files? Nope. Okay. What we're gonna do now, because I like copy and paste on my machines, I'll install a few packages using the package manager named apt. Uh, CA certificates is package. Um, that's basically who to trust. Um, imagine like this. If you are on a website, let's say Google, you have that little icon because you're running it over HTTPS. And it says about the certificate that um, there is, um, they are trusted by a CA. The Google Trust Services uh, Global Sign Root Certificate which trusts the GTS CA and which trusts Google.com. So this is chain of trust. It's like, I know you, I trust you. And as you trust your friend, I'm going to trust that person too. I know it's risky in real world, but uh, you know, um, that's how relationships work in the internet. 
and the CA certificates draws in the uh, root certificates. And it gives me the OpenSSL toolkit, which basically uh, gives me um, the functions to deal with certificates. As you see, we're pulling in dependencies. Um, the next package I'm going to install is VGET for downloading. And the plain open SSH server because all oh, hacking in on a graphical console like that just sucks. As you see, it pulls in a lot of packages on the upper uh, part. And it would suggest me a couple of um, new packages like Keychain, Monkey Sphere, Emoligard, and uh, whatnot, so ever. To be honest, that's about the packages I don't want to have in there. And uh, we still have the test user, which we're gonna um, just eliminate right now. Yoink. Uh, there we go. So, the OpenSSH server is good, and we could, in theory, SSH into the machine. In theory. So, it was uh, 111. So let's say uh, it says, yeah, I can log in and uh, it won't take my password, which kind of sucks for us. And on the other hand, it's good for us. Let me explain. Um, if you are out on the internet with a server, uh, there are many bots out there who are trying to brute force and guess that password. So what we're, uh, what the community did was um, they denied root login with a password. So how do we get around? If I'm going to the uh, my home directory, as you see with the um, tilde, uh, I can make a directory, which is a hidden directory. Um, you don't see it here. If I invoke it with a show me all stuff, you see it, everything with a dot is hidden. It's the same thing on the Mac because Macintosh is based on FreeBSD, which is based on a GNU system. So it's the same thing. So my SSH directory will give me an edge on logging in. Um, I'm going to fetch a file named authorized keys which is basically my SSH key, the public key, which looks a bit like this. I know it sounds pretty complicated, but it isn't. This is just something, the public part of my key and the private part is my private part. So I have it somewhere, uh, not those private parts. Please don't get me wrong. We're here on the clean stream, even if I I've, if I run a dirty mouth like that. So uh, what I can do now is I just duplicate the session and log in as root and uh, it loaded as you can see authenticating with public key from the agent so i was running a local program as you can see an agent that authenticates against the key so i can run this virtual machine right off this and uh, now let's see what we can do oh uh, i'm gonna reconfigure apt App is the package manager and it runs off the sources list. Sources list, that's where, you know, um, it's like the archive is over there. I get the patches from over there. And uh, I'm going to be lazy and I'm just going to copy that from a different server of mine. Or uh, in my case, it's my mail server. Come on sources list and uh, it's not yeah not a big deal so as you see just grabbing that thing that's not a comment so this part cleaning that out and um, just checking it in here fixing the line breaks and we're nearly done now, if you would excuse me for a second, there's something that is authorization files. Um, yeah, I know uh, you would love to have the credentials to my uh, registry, 
But I won't give you that for security reasons. Um, a second, it's the auth.conf file and I'm just plopping the credentials in there and uh, we're back on my desktop stream. There you go. Now we have the sources in and I can run my opt update. And as you see, we're running against the registry Stargazer AT repository and uh, downloads should happen much faster. As you see, um, oh, I think, yeah, main contrib, I have a typo in my sources list. There we go. Oh, running the up update again and we're green across the board. Now, if I want to install software, I mean, I can just install it. And uh, if you're running an old kernel like this, you're lacking out on features like, um, well, Prim for SSD car, uh, uh, SSD disks or NVMe disks, and uh, you want to take care of those disks. So you can install my kernel. And uh, I've set up a GitHub project, which is a kernel.org kernel for Debian. And uh, you can read uh, all the reasons here. I run them in different flavors. So like a VM kernel for all the machine, a game server ready kernel. And uh, you can install them running this script. But for running that, uh, I need two packages. Uh, which are curl and sudo. Um, I just uh, installed them for one reason. I want to show you off my cool mirror because it's so fast because it's, you know, hooked up directly to my machine. Boink. And we're done. Hey, I know it's funny. <clears throat> it just works. So, um, I just plop in that command, hit enter, and we're good to go. It just installs the uh, packages that you need to add an external repository like this. And uh, Package Cloud was so kind to host this for me. And I'm really, really, really glad about them uh, because I wouldn't be able to handle the bandwidth on my own. And as you see, we're set up. And uh, what it actually did was in etc apt, we've got the sources list.d and there's the Debian kernels uh, list. So that's just a split of part that you put in there. It's like if you want to run a MariahDB and um, you want to run it off the, um, let's say, oh, let's just dive into that, the database server, you go to their repository config instead of the downloads. And then you just uh, get the thing going, you know? You say, okay, I'm going to the repositories. I'm running, let's say, a Debian Buster. I want to run the uh, most recent version. And it says, come on, just plop that into the sources list file, which would be uh, located in this directory. You see it's in etc app sources list D and I would call it, let's say, MariahDB.list. Oh, now I need a breather. And some tea. As you can see, I'm a complete caffeine addict. So for getting the new kernel, I'm just going to do apt install. And I named the package vanilla kernel. And uh, this package, or I could just go for the uh, VM or Gentoo kernel. You know, let's, let's try this Gentoo kernel. I've never actually run it on a virtual box. But as you see, this is a meta package. Let's say, um, let's say dummy package that just consists of a few things. Dependencies. It depends on the uh, Linux kernel headers that if you need to compile something against the kernel, you need the headers. Um, yeah, you, you can compile drivers against that. All kind of funky stuff. That's, that's something you really need. Trust me, you will need them. Especially if you are running, let's say, uh, VMware tools or uh, some other tools that hook into the kernel. 
then the kernel itself and a C library that runs with the kernel. So let's just get that. Okay, uh, warning, stream cheater ahead because that's actually coming from the internet. Of it. Now, if you look at this, um, we've pretty much set up a machine with our kernel and we're good to go. So yeah, that machine is pretty secure and we haven't touched the console yet. So we could run that headless. And if you're running, let's say uh, Raspbian and you want to run the Raspi OS and stuff, you just plop the, the SSH uh, file in it and you can run that headless. Anything I show you here, I mean, most of the things will run on your uh, Raspberry Pi as well. So as we've got a new kernel, which is the 5.12.1, which is as of now, a pretty recent version, not to say the most recent version. Glad we've sorted that out. So let's just reboot and uh, see what happens. As you see, it's coming up with the brand unified bootloader, the Grub. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to skip over to the advanced options. And uh, what you see here is basically the old kernels and your new kernel. So if things go south, you can just uh, go to advanced options and go back to your kernel. And uh, if you just boot it up, it loads up as usual. And it should do a good job about that. Let's see. We're at the login and we can go back to restarting our session. If it lets us. We can log in here. I'm just gonna check the IP address because, okay. We don't have network. So, yeah. As you see. This is not bad. Absolutely not bad. Um, was it me? Just gonna read through the kernel log. I mean, we can always fix that uh, coming in with the old uh, driver. But as we are emulating a um, with a virtual machine, I can just swap out the network card. So my network is um. Okay, I'm just going to use an Intel Pro uh, server adapter. Just boot it up again and see if it uh, if it likes this one. If not, we're going to use the vanilla kernel, and uh, I'm going to just file the bug then. Let's boot it up and see what happens. we go we're logged in network is up and we are back on the old address and uh yeah we can just log back in root and we don't need a password so lesson learned you could in theory use a bad password which i absolutely don't recommend because you can't log in using ssh but if you're a user and you're using su to switch user, you're screwed anyway. So a good password is always a good idea. Uh, about my machines here. Uh, as you see, this one's checking along pretty well. Just keeping this or having it in my background. So what do we want to do on this machine? As you see, I'm um, reading the boot log and see if there's anything or uh, you know, suspicious. And no, it's been booting fine. Okay, uh, the high, uh, high precision timer lost a few interrupts, but that's because of the uh, virtual machine here. So, what can we do with this machine? If we want to set up a game server or anything, uh, that's where usually the audience should give me um, a suggestion. 
What do you want to do? Um, in my case, I'm gonna just uh, create me another user. And uh, I can switch to that user. And as you say, we're on, um, on a new shell. But that's not good. That's not good enough. So if you're lazy as me, you can just uh, edit the shell in the um, uh, ATC password file. And I'm using a bash, uh, bash here because it's just, you know, a bit more um, convenient. Um, hi, Savvy. I'm not using your first name here because it just spells out weird in English. Because, uh, you know, uh, what English speaking people can do with your name. Yeah, it's hilarious. At least I would think that when I heard it the first time. Um, I know you weren't. So, my user is set up, as you say. I've got no permissions in the root directory, which is great. I'm just going to CD back to my home directory, and that's where I have my stuff ready. I'm going to just um, plant my SSH key here again. There we go, and I can log in as my user again without a password. So as this user, I can't do system administration stuff. As you say, permission denied. But if I run with uh, sudo, I could. Now we run into problem. We don't have a password set. So as um, setting a password, I could do that like um, issuing the command pass uh, word as we did. Uh, current password is none. Okay, so we run into trouble here. So I'm gonna go over to root and say password. I want to change it for the uh, for this user, and I'm just gonna write a new password in. There we go, and it's working. Uh, this user, if I duplicate, can log in using a password and the SSH key. So, yeah. Now, um, it doesn't. As you see, I'm not in the sudo file. Or can you say vsudo? And say, okay, um, I want to allow special groups to uh, run our special users commands. So do that, shall we? Use a mod is uh, way, uh, the way to go. If you don't know what a command does, try adding uh, dash dash help. And uh, as you see, this provides us great uh, help. And uh, you can modify a user because it's user mod user add and user del is our uh, stuff. So what I want to do is add groups. Want to add me to the pseudo group. Um, because, yeah, I could also change the shell in here, but we did that before. Um, add me to the pseudo group. Now, um, if that user is logged in, that user needs to log back out and uh, in again and uh, as you see it's working now sudo is really a handy tool but be careful on who you give uh, sudo permissions because I can always bug out using sudo su and now I am root so careful with who you trust in your system now, as we're here, um, the shell, the Linux shell, this black screen isn't scary at all. Trust me. It's a cool thing to have. Really. Um, like Nano is a text editor here. You can write text with it. No problem. Um, you might say, hey, Ray, you're stupid. On the shell, you can't browse the web. And I just want to say, 
think again. You sure? Let me just pull in a program called Lynx. Lynx is a text console browser. And if I want to, I can go to google.com and we're on the search engine and it even works with the mouse. So see, we're getting that. You can read websites on the shell. You can download files, so no big deal. What else are you missing? Um, there is a lot of stuff you can do on the shell. Trust me. It's a fun. It's really something unique. I mean, if you're living on the shell, um, what are you uh, trying to do? Well, you might want to compile software. Yeah, of course you can. Uh, you just can't install it on the system because you don't have access to, uh, if you don't have read, I mean, um, sorry. Let me start that again. You don't have write access to where you want to put the software, but you can compile it. As an example, you can just go to kernel.org, um, download the kernel, and get that to compile. See, that's where the download is going, and you say, okay, uh, yeah. Here we go. You just need to install the compiler. I'm just um, killing that for now because it's not worth it. Um, sometimes you want to do a bit more on the console. So let me throw in another program here. That's cool. Um, screen. Screen is a tool that allows you to do things and uh, set that in the background. Let's say I start screen, then I'm greeted with a shell. So you think it's doing nothing? Okay, let me enlighten you. Um, let's say I want to see something like the kernel lock running here, backing out. Doing something real quick like um, install htop, a process manager. Uh, if I would spell that right, where we're green on. We go, I'll look at something and uh, screen dash r brings you back to exactly where you left. Cool. That's something I use uh, very often. Because if I'm, uh, let's say, uh, let's just use this machine as an example. I'm just starting the update process here and it's working, it's doing its job and uh, I don't want to be connected all the time. It's my uh, SQL server. So if I just detach, I can log off and uh, log in from a different workstation. and uh, come back to it and see it's doing its thing. Still doing its thing, working. Don't need to worry about it. I can even share my screen session with somebody else. So I've done that a couple of times to teach people. So if I just duplicate this session, let's say I'm on a different um, machine, uh, coming from a different machine, I can do screen uh, minus X and I'm seeing the same thing on two screens. I can also, um, you know, detach here and everything like that. So it's not really hard. Um, previously, I've spoken to you about that the kernel can only launch one process. Let me show that to you. As you see, we've got one process here. At the beginning, I've uh, made that as a tree. And this one's PID number one which is running as root as a system user, which is sbin init. 
the init system is basically launching shell or uh, system the user sessions the sshd uh the crone um the uh, wpa or uh, supply uh Supplicant, which is uh, responsible for wireless LAN, Anacron, RSS log day, and anything that you see here. So this system is pretty slim. DF-H uh, shows us uh, the disk usage. And our mini system is 1.4 gigabyte. That's not much, honestly. If I just run that across my uh, windows here, Oh, by the way, this one can work in the background. Um, let's just take the windows alone and just enumerate the files in there. And we're already crossed the line with 13.5 um, gigs, 13.7. So, yeah. Don't want to bore you with that or uh, watching the counter, but that's massive compared to what uh, we're running here. I mean... We're still comparing apples with peers here because uh, Windows is a graphical uh, graphical thing. But we've got all the drivers in there, all the, the drivers that we need. And uh, we're pretty good. If I want to um, check a directory. Let's say how big are my log files. I can use du dash s h um as root because yeah uh we're running on 16 meg logs here i mean they will increase to let's say five gigs or something but they will be rotated at some point so no big deal um what else what else can we do on this machine we can run a game server should we set one up for you Okay, you've got me convinced. So, I'm gonna fetch my browser and uh, just minimize a couple of things here. We've got the Linux Game Server Manager, which is a nifty script, uh, which is written in Bash. I know, I know. What is Bash? Bash is a shell, so imagine as uh, it doesn't really need much stuff. It's really so nice. As you see with a server supported, you can say uh, you want to have a seven today, uh, seven days to die server. Arc. Um, what else do we have here? Battlefield, Black Mesa, Blade Symphony, COD. Um. Counter-Strike servers, Day of Defeat, um, what else? Don't Starve, Echo, Empires, uh, ET was, I think, enemy territory? Don't remember that. Garry's Mod, Factorio, and, uh, in fact, I'm looking for, um, <clears throat> if we have that here. I mean, Minecraft, of course. Mumble, Natural Selection, No More Room in Hell. Hyper MC, okay, that's a Minecraft thing. Um, but -dum -ba -dum -ba -dum. Quake, yeah, nice. Rising World, and uh, I mean, I could just use uh, Control F, but I just want to show you that there is even Team Fortress or a TeamSpeak server. Terraria. Oh, I mean, Valheim. All here, you can make your own Valheim server. Not a big deal. Just do it. So. If you've chosen your server, you can just uh, download the script and we'll head to the documentation section here and it says getting started. Uh, you have something like the um, prerequisites. So um, let's just see. I'll just run, um, what should we do? A Rust server should do. Oh, come on. It says uh, 4 to 12 gigs of RAM. Okay. 
uh, dual core of uh, 3.4 gigahertz bandwidth. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, don't really wanna, you know. You can do everything here pretty easy. So yeah. Let's start with a Linux game server manager. Because on getting started, it says you need something. Okay. We had our Rust server. Come on, where are you? There we go. There we go. It says, okay, it works on Ubuntu, Debian, CentOS. Uh, CentOS is a dead distro, so don't worry about that. Although not tested, it says anything should be compatible. And uh, yeah, the dependencies is something where you say, okay, I want to have some packages installed. So just gonna copy that and punch that in here. It's, uh, I'm doing this as my user here because I don't want to clog the uh, root ser um, user because as a system administrator and uh, running a game server as root is the worst thing you can do. That's like, you know, um, leaving your car open and all your valuables in it uh, and having a sign on it. My purse is on, uh, in the, um, you know, never ever run as all uh, that stuff as root. That's so bad. That's, that's suicide. So now uh, that we've got that out of the way, you might want to install game dig. Um, do we have that in that list already? Nope. Uh, game dig is a Node.js thing. Uh, which is kind of nifty for querying game servers. So it's command line executable where you say, okay, let's install game dig. npm Okay, we need Node.js. Let's hit it. And for just silencing that message, I'm going to auto remove some packages that I don't need, which are the old and outdated kernels. So Node.js it is. Okay, that message is gone. And we can also uh, suggest packages we need NPM. So that's working fine. And as you see, uh, we're pulling in a bunch of things. <laughs> and by a bunch of things, I mean really a huge list. As you see, that's uh, 294 packages just for running Node.js. I mean, no big deal. You can run it without GameDig, but I prefer to have it because GameDig gives me a lot of information about what's going on in the server. I can use it to list players to get anything about the server. Running it in scripts, Archon, well, you name it. There is a lot of things you can do with Node.js here. So, and they say it's recommended, but you know. So to install it, they say you need to add your user, which we've already done. We're doing it on my user. Then you need to um, switch to that user, which they do with switch user, the dash for reading the environment. And then they say, okay, there's a script, which we will of course download and slap on the server after uh, game dig is installed. Yeah, it's a matrix. I, d uh, I don't see um, code here. I see a blonde, Brunette, the black haired. Oh, wait, I'm not Cypher. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, for most of the people, it looks kind of weird. But to be honest, living on the shell, it's like we save us the resources that a display server would need. Think about it. If you run a game server, what do you want to do on it? You want to uh, have it painting pretty background pictures or do you want to have it running the game? So um, 
if I'm installing with npm game dick, it's binary, I can run. <clears throat> um, oh yeah. There we go. Uh, don't worry, this is, uh, this, the jitter will be over in a second because it just got that stuff. Okay, the package is installed in my local uh, thing and we need to adjust something. You've got npm. Um, sorry, node modules, that's it. And there is the uh, .bin directory where our stuff is stored. So, as you might know from uh, Windows, there is a variable that's called path. That's where uh, the system is looking for programs that you punch in. And we want to have game dig therein too. So, I can uh, put that in my bash RC like this. Um, okay, let me see, we've got the bash aliases, yeah, I can also slap it into the bash profile, so, and bash or C's file, uh, fine. Okay, I want to have my path as the path that's current set. And this. And I just want to export it because, you know, that's how it works. So if I log out here and uh, log back in reading my profile, um, you see I made a terrible mistake on typing. Because it's not just node modules, it's in my home directory. And uh, I usually add the home directory bin path too, so that should be fine. And I think it was the uh, dots, not the semicolon. So. Game dig is installed. And yeah. Basically, it's working. You could run it with a newer Node.js version, which we can uh, do. Uh, Node.js itself is, as you know, a JavaScript runtime. And if I want to say an LTS branch, which is a um, long term service uh, thing, it's okay. We've got the Linux binaries. I could download them or just uh, go with uh, Node.js uh, Debian repository, which is pretty easy. So you see, you could add the um, TPA, which is pretty much just this one. So I'm going to do that. Node source setup is something where it says, okay, what do you want to do? Um, going for the LTS branch. Script looks good. And I just run it. And uh, we should be doing this as root. And uh, now it's uh, pulling in the packages and updating our Node.js. As you see, it's importing the key and uh, yeah. If I want to uh, build add-ons, I need to get GCC, all the compiler and stuff. Um, you know, I'm gonna run full upgrade here. Um, yeah. As you see, I'm not used to really um, 
working as a user much because I usually do my stuff as root. Apt uh, dist upgrade was it, I guess. Or was it a full upgrade? Uh, we're getting the node packages uh, now replaced because um, we're using the overlay, having a bit more modern uh, Node.js, one that's supported, and not that bloody old one that's shipped with Debian. <clears throat> so yeah, that's something that works, even if it looks kind of silly. So, let's see. Yeah, that's pretty pretty more recent. Can I update? Okay. That better? Yes. Now it's running fine. As you see, sometimes a bit of uh, more modern software helps. And uh, we're back on installing the Linux game server manager. And this is the Month they want us to uh, invoke, which is basically um, downloading the script, giving it execute permissions, and saying, please install the Rust server. And this is happening as a user. Now it's uh, fetch the basic uh, things. I can do a Rust server install. And this is where it gets funny. <clears throat> it gets the modules, the missing modules from GitHub. I know this is doing it twice, but uh, the Linux game server manager is once fetching the script and then the installer modules specific for that game server. Good thing is uh, if I screw up at some point, I can just throw my user away, clear the user home directory by just deleting it and start from scratch without really hurting my system. As you see, it's pulling in the stuff now. So, uh, are we sure? Good question. Um, Hi, uh, Nidopa. How you doing? As you see, um, this is it's creating the directories and we're basically good to go. It checks for the packages, if they are there like Python or things to pack, unpack, or um, Tmux, which is a funky alternative to screen and it says, okay, Steam command isn't installed. So yeah, it's installing the dependencies and we're good to go. Now, what this means is, as you see, it's just updating, giving the missing packages a whirl and uh, we're good. Fantastic. And that game server is still pretty small. What I'm going to do is I'll just duplicate the uh, session here. And we'll look at the disk space again. As you see, we are just at 1.7 gigs here. So a Linux package isn't really big. I know this sounds confusing to you. But look at it like this. If you buy, let's say, a game on a compact disc, what they had on it was the visual uh, studio components, visual C components, DirectX. So there was always a big portion of um, dependencies that were shipped with the um, CDs in the old times or even nowadays on DVDs, if you know what that is. Um, on Steam, we don't ship that uh, those anymore, but yes. As you see, the stuff is getting downloaded. Stream will be jittering because we're getting that from the network. And it's pretty obvious the Rust server will work. I can add that server, of course, to my own uh, Rust game and can game on it. Just starting the, um, the game server and we're good to go. You know, funny thing is you can uh, carry that server with you to go on a LAN party. Oh, this is where you, you know, just take your computer to a friend, play with them in a local area network, or where you're not really uh, just hooked up to the internet. It's fun, you know? 
or it's having or uh, this is why I love those servers. Let me switch to just chatting again for you. It's a much better, uh, much more um satisfying environment here. So why do you want to run your own game server? Uh, for me, this is pretty obvious because I run a small community uh, that you see right over there. Oh, uh, that small community is where mm, that's how I play games. I play with them. We know each other and uh, what we're doing is playing together. We don't have to fight our way through a lobby or anything like that. Just going to cancel the download. Um, and we'll hop on to another game server uh, if you really want to see how that stuff's working out. But that's that's how it works. It's easy as that. And uh, you can do that yourself without, uh, you know, without great experience. I mean, a root server is not for anybody. Trust me. So um, there are companies like Hetzner or One at One or wherever where you can rent a root server. What is a root server? Basically a box plugged into the internet, giving you access, letting you run your stuff. And people might say, um, that's all you need. Mm, honestly, no. This is where the big danger comes in. Or if you think about stuff like um, hackers, script kiddies, somebody just trying to take your server down. That's one thing. There, if you have a weak password, somebody might uh, abuse your server. And no, you aren't secure because there's just your clan on the server. It's, it doesn't make it more secure who's, who's on the server. It's still got the tax surface. So, you know, it's kind of a, um, a weird uh, situation there. So if you, you might think if you ha uh, have a root server, you might have total control. Um, nope. The uh, admin where you have rented the server can just unplug your server. Another misconception uh, about root servers is people might say uh, root servers are, um, you can install anything you want to. Mm. I would say just read what they have as terms of services there. Sometimes you aren't allowed to install, let's say, RSC servers on uh, some boxes because there are problems. So you can't do that. And admin interfaces are nice on the server, but seriously? Just speaking about those admin interfaces, uh, if you think about it, uh, what if that admin interface breaks? You really need to know your stuff out then. And uh, if you're doing something wrong, you might lose your server, get in touch with um, some bloodthirsty lawyer, and um, it's your liability to keep that server secure. So this is always a risk. And if your server is then abused to whatever, I mean, I don't wanna um, say the bad word here that they might be distributing spam or child porn on the server, but they may, I mean, uh, <clears throat> If they abuse it and you don't notice it, you're in serious trouble, mate. So yeah, um, back to the servers, shall we? Um, yeah, we have an Arc server here, which I run. Coming up right now. Uh, just gonna find the button. Here's my Arc server. Um, gonna show it to you from this side. As you see, it's running the island. And uh, as you see with the Tmux session, it is running the um, game server manager. So I installed it here. It's running pretty nice, running some backup software, the usual uh, services that you need. That's all dandy. And uh, why do you want to run an Arc server or some server on your own? Uh, this depends. If you're looking at the big guys like Gportal, you need a decent uh, internet line for them. Okay, I take it. If you don't have a decent line, rent your server somewhere. But if you have a decent line and you just wanna play with your friends, or if you live in a household like I do, and uh, I've got two players sitting here, 
and we want to play together. That's perfect. So, uh, let's fire up Ark, shall we? I'm just gonna pause the music while we're firing up Ark. And uh, that's how it works. Cool stuff. Um, you go in the background on the you close down because yeah, I don't need you anymore. Boom. Dissing software. Um, as you can hear the lovely music on, on the Arc server. Um, our client, sorry, as we're starting up. Oh, I messed it up. Tipped. Jesus, I need to get more professional. And I need more tea. Um, hi, Talina. How are you doing? How are the kids? Um, don't mind the Oculus software here. Uh, VR doesn't work with Arc. They had a proof of concept in somewhere and uh, it sucked. So this is basically Arc. As you see, I've already added my server. And you might want to uh, ask me on how to do that. Well, for that, we need to um, get into Steam. Um, private servers are usually... Um, you go to view in your Steam library, and there is a point called servers. Very important. Um, and this gives you a new window. This new window uh, shows you a list of servers that you have added to your favorites. So you can just uh, add a server. Hack in the IP of that server because it's not an uh, official uh, official server, so it won't be uh, listed as uh, it would have been if you would have just rented on cheap portal. And uh, as you see, I've added mine over there, and then it shows up in Arc if you join Arc. And I selected favorites here and uh, done the. All maps, all mods, and stuff like that. And here is my server. And I have to say, the ping is fantastic. Yeah, that's because this server is right in my LAN network. You won't get a, ping, a better ping anywhere else. Oh, uh, and I'm just joining my server here. And the fun part is, this server is actually really in my room here. And uh, we've limited uh, the server to 16 slots just because we can. And uh, it's running since three years. So I really love Arc and, uh, you know. But the problem with Arc is on the official servers for me, it's too much stress. I don't want to sit there timing a dino for days. I just don't want to. So what I'm going to do is I've fiddled and tweaked the settings to uh, match my thing, added a couple of flavor mods like candles. You know, some sprinkles here, some sprinkles there, and it's loading in. As you see, the uh, mod size uh, does a lot about it. And we have two huge mods. One is the uh, Structures Plus for building, and another huge um, thing is the Steampunk mod. Uh, if you watch in our Discord, there is a mod collection if you feel like you want to know what's going on there. And as you see, it's catching up now. We're at 6 of 19. That's good. Um, one of those things is Automated Arc split their uh, mods in uh, set into 7 uh, mods instead of 1. So that's why the high number is up there because, yeah, you know. Ouch. Never hit your knuckles on the desk. That hurts. Ouch. Anyways, um, what do we have here? Number nine, that's good. Um, upstairs, fortunately, yeah, uh, kids out of the way is always a good thing. I can think about that. Um, I've got a problem. I'm educating myself, my inner kid, by myself, so I'm I'm pretty lost with that. Um, that might explain my uh big mouth. <clears throat> And my nasty jokes. So I haven't had education from myself since a long time. Yep. So uh, 16 mods done. And uh, about the server. I've optimized um, Arc. Mm, don't want to say has a performance problem. 
because it literally is a performance problem. Uh, Arc runs on three network, uh, three cores or on three um, threads. Uh, one is the game engine itself, one is the uh, physical engine, and one uh, is the network. And usually the network is starving and stuff like that. So uh, the game experience is suboptimal. And uh, I've tackled that with a custom kernel, which is the game server kernel I'm running on my system. And if you even want more performance, I uh, have tapped into uh, the dark arts of real-time kernels. If you want to know what that is, um, I can talk about that after showing off the server, if you want to. So, server's here. And I'm just doing something against that ugly green circle bug, which is always happening uh, for the first login on my server. Oh, hello, Deadpool. Breaking L. Good job on finding that one. Um, yeah, that's something you should uh, know on this server. Uh, we are breeding a lot of diners and uh, we've got friends. Uh, bring in creatures every now and then and uh, so whenever I'm here I see something new um this is Server isn't really warmed up. There's nothing in the cache and I'm streaming using the graphics card and we're having a giga down there Oh, hello and a bird here which is going down. Okay. Enough uh, meddling with that, and I'll show you the performance. I'm just gonna jump here and uh, try not to break my neck while uh, while flying down. So as you hear, the meow was my login signal because I'm monitoring my server for logins, and uh, if my friends log in, I just get in meow or right, move to just get my ass online so I can play with them. So, as we're flying uh, to the base, you can see a uh, Titan over there, that's midway, a little marker. Uh, if you want to have a Yo Mama joke, I'll do it for the Titan with you. Uh, your Titan's so fat, it's got its own postal code. Yep, that's it. That's our Titan. So, as I'm landing in here, without breaking my neck, you see the whole base is loading in in fairly quickly and I'm just walking up to the hotel. I'm just walking around. So this is really huge. Uh, yeah, the server is called Victoria's Secret uh, because it's not listed. So that's something, you know, we thought it's, it's funny because, you know, secret because it's not listed and uh, you're starting in your underwear anyway. So yeah, why not calling it Victoria's Secret? As you see, no problems with the lag or just with my steering because I'm not really paying close attention. But that's server performance. That's what we call server performance. That's why I'm hosting the server on my own. And with uh, about 300 dinos out there, um, yeah, just saying this is really Big, big, big um, stash of dinos. Oh, nice. We've got black beauties here. Okay. I've got time to breed at some point. Um, Don't mind me. It's, you know, just getting excited for my next breeding project. So, yeah, that's uh, basically why we are running our own server like this with a custom kernel. So... <clears throat> I'm gonna get out of ARC because that's not an ARC stream. We're just chatting about it. But I had to prove it. So, as you see, the lag here was mostly client lag on my side because my GPU is just busy encoding stuff. And, uh, oh, I see. Well, uh, speaking about the ARC server, usually people say it's not recommended to play ARC on a CPU with less than uh, 3 gigahertz. Okay. Our CPU here on this machine is a freaking E5 with 2 
gigahertz. So that performance shouldn't be possible at all. Don't tell the server. Don't tell the server. Uh, what I did is building a real-time kernel. And uh, this is something where we need to tap into our theory a bit. Uh, what is real-time? Real-time in the sense of computers. Yep, just got to get rid of my uh, hair clip here because I just want to lean back. Okay, real-time, what is it? Um, think about it like this. Your computer has a job. It does something. And when it's finished, it's finished. Okay? So the same process can take on a normal computer. Um, the time can vary because of uh, things happening in the background and whatever. But there are critical processes in the world where you don't want to have that. It's like when you're doing audio, when you're doing weapons, when you're doing encoding. Uh, you don't want to fuck that stuff up. You always want to have that the same timing. And this is where real time comes in. Real time ensures that the same process is always taking the same amount of time. That sounds very funky, but think about it like this. If you're playing on a server and uh, you're used to something like the latency of your net and you add just a bit of lag to that, or you don't notice it. So if you, or let's say, pull the trigger and your game gun shoots, let's say, 200 milliseconds later, it's fine. Because it always does that. That's where it gets annoying for you. That's when lag spikes come up. And this is when it sometimes takes up to two seconds. And sometimes it's just firing instantaneously. So you don't know when. And that's where, it, where I say, that sucks. So this is why I... Uh, did my own real-time kernel, especially for that. Especially for that system. And uh, it doesn't make the server per se run faster, but it ensures that my, um, my game server, which isn't built as a real-time process, but runs better. Because the network process isn't allowed to starve. We're allowed to shift priorities around a lot and uh, it makes a huge difference. We've tried it out uh, on the vanilla Debian kernel and it run, yeah, I don't want to say pretty bad because it was really freaking bad. It was awful. It was like the launch of Cyberpunk. It was literally unplayable. <laughs> yeah, uh, it felt pretty much like an official server. So I invested some time and uh, changed a few settings on, uh, on the kernel. Uh, basically what I did on my game server kernel, and it went a lot better. Um, with that in mind, if I go with a, um, a, a server that's working differently, by the way, uh, thank you, uh, Beowulf, uh, Beowulfie61. In case you are still in the chat, thanks for the follow. Uh, well, um, where was I? Okay, I totally screwed up here by looking at the followers, but I love it. I love you people because I do this for you. I know how to set up the servers. Uh, what I'm saying is those real-time servers are a lot of work to do. I can do them custom for your server in case you wanted to, but yeah, in return, I want a little favor, to be honest, because it's so much work. It would be fun if I could do that as a job, you know, like optimizing game servers all over the, uh, the country, keeping them updated. It would be fun, to be honest. Um, I've tried my uh, kernel settings on various game systems like Rust servers. Uh, I've got a friend who's playing Rust and he said, it's amazing uh, how the server changed. I was on the server watching myself and um, explosions in Rust um, Rust is a bit different. They use a different game engine and they are not so uh, bad uh, with the engine. So, yeah, it made a huge difference because explosions went so smooth. It wasn't laggy at all. He was really torturing the server and testing. And uh, 
it holds up pretty well. I was I was astonished to be honest. But what what would you expect if you just run your own game server, tweak it, and take care of it? Of course, it runs better than some mass hoster. That's why we do it. That's why I love my job. So yeah, and that's also what I do as a sysadmin, putting my knowledge to the um, to use, to good use. Um, you've seen me logging in without a password. So, um, it's about the SSH keys. Um, do you want to know about those? Want to, or I can show you how that's done. Um, the easiest way of doing so is using Putty. Putty is a program that's your SSH client to go. You can also use Kitty if you want to, or, you know, any fork of that. So, if you're watching my desktop, you can see I'm looking up a program, which is called PuttyGen. This is a key generator where you can uh, generate your private key. You usually want to go with an uh, 8025519 key, that's this one. And uh, you just hit generate, then you move your mouse around, and uh, you get two parts. One is your key, where you say, okay, you save your private key. You can do that with a password. And um, in my case, I'm just gonna uh, put it on the desktop here. There is it. And I've got my um, public key in here. Uh, that's, that looks awfully similar, right? That's exactly uh, what I have in the authorized key files. And uh, if I take uh, this server here, I can uh, just slam it in here and uh, get in there and get cracking. And uh, if you don't want to use a key anymore, you just uh, delete it from the file, save, and you're good to go. And that's basically all the magic that you need with SSH keys. And uh, if you want to make it extra fancy, you can uh, put it in your startup folder so it gets loaded on uh, Windows startup. And that's pretty much all I have for you today. Thank you for watching the Let's Chat tutorial here about game servers, Debian machines, and me goofing around a little. Hey, thanks for watching. See you. Goodbye.